Welcome, friends. I am uh, meeting for the first time my newest friend, uh, Derek Kinney, who comes to us from our... Derek, are you in Arlington? Or I'm Arlington? in Arlington, Texas, home of the Dallas Cowboys and Texas Rangers. Yeah. And you belong to the Arlington Rotary Club, correct? That's correct. 20... It's been 20 plus years now and really 20 plus years of the best years of my life. I love Rotary. Some of the best relationships I've ever had. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I, as I said to you a, a few moments ago, I feel like a slow learner because I've been in Rotary for a dozen years, but it just took me a while to really understand its true value. And so what happened here is that I was reading um, the Rotary magazine on my iPad, and uh, I come across this article called "The New Math" by Derek Kinney, and um, and it goes into detail of a framework that you have developed. And um, I excitedly sent you an email, and you were gracious enough to accept. So, thank you for that. Well, thanks for having me, John. I'm looking forward to a great conversation with you. Well, I get to know you now by asking you, you know, wh where you're from originally, um, who were your influencers when you were growing up? Well, I was born in Washington State, and so I vaguely remember that as a kid. We moved six times before the sixth grade. So wow. uh, we ended up in Buffalo, New York when I was in the fifth grade and moved down from Buffalo down to Arlington, Texas in the sixth grade. And this has been home for me ever since then. You know, my dad would uh, change jobs or get promoted and so forth. And so didn't have a lot of close friendships growing up, but began to make those as I was in junior high and high school. And right. there was an experience that I had. Uh, I've, got, I've got a fairly large nose. And so I was teased about that a lot as a kid. It was very formative for me. Yeah. And uh, to work my way out of that, I decided to run for student body president my junior year in high school. I was a nobody with the heart of a somebody. Yeah. And I recognized there were a lot of other people like me who were sort of the wallflowers. They, they went to school and they hung out in their particular cliques and their groups, but nobody really brought them together. And this idea was, what if I connected with them in a campaign and said, hey, let me get a picture of you and I shaking hands and we'll put a poster board of you and I above where you hang out with your group. And suddenly they became the cool person in their group yeah. and we won the election. And it wasn't just me that won. It, it wasn't the me show that day, John, it was the we show. And it taught me a valuable lesson that I've carried into business today. And that is that if people feel heard and listened to and deeply valued, you can build a business because they want to work with you because you have empathy, and you connect with them. And that principle helped guide me to build a very successful financial planning practice, sell, sell it about two years ago, and now launch that into a new business consulting company. But it's all based on those bedrock principles I learned as a, as a high school student of listening, valuing people, and making sure they feel recognized and understood. And I think right now in this country, we need a lot more of that, and we would have a lot more success, not just business-wise, but personally as well. Derek, it strikes me as you tell that story, though, that what you did was extremely mature. Did you come up with this on your own, or, you know, how, how did this happen? Well, you know, when your back's against the wall, you think of a lot of creative ideas. And, yeah, yeah this was an idea that I had, and for some reason, it just came to me that, Inside of me, there was more, but I needed to find a way to release it. And my mom had given me a book. It was a book called Go For It by a woman named Judy Zarefa. Basically, it was a book on how to survive the teenage years. Mm -hmm. And there was a chapter in the book, believe it or not, called How to Be Popular. And that chapter really appealed to me. And so it talked about you know, how to make friends and how to, you know, how to connect with people and how to build respect and rapport. And I began to put those principles into practice. I had nothing to lose, everything to gain. But as I began to just recognize and befriend people, I realized, you know, there's a lot of people here. While it may feel like we had a large high school of a couple thousand kids, yes. and it can feel like there's one big community, but it's just a lot of individuals right. in a community. And if you could bring them together, that was really the magic. And so that's what it taught me. 
And I remember the day I actually uh, had some friends come over and we uh, rented, I, I saved up my money. I was working part-time and I rented a Lincoln Town Car that my dad took a day of vacation to drive up and down in front of the school. And it was a way to stand out in front of the other five candidates. And it was harder money that I had worked at the grocery store a lot to save up to do that. But I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just me that was winning, it was us. And, and, and the vibe of my senior year we just had our class reunion about two about two weeks ago. Right. And people commented on, Derek, do you remember when? And they talked about that year. And it was a year where people felt important. Mm -hmm. And when you can make other people feel important, you know, Maya Angelou talks about it's not what you do and it's not how you do it, but it's how you make people feel. Right. And they have that experience and they feel important and valued. Right. There's literally nothing that you can't accomplish because they want to help you be successful. You know, the other thing that I heard in those two stories is both your mom and dad contributed to this. You know, they were in on your team. Was your mom a, a homemaker or did she work outside the home? As she was primarily a homemaker, but to help us make ends meet, she worked at a local retail store. Yeah. And, and you know, she sensed the, uh, you know, big noses kind of ran in our family. So she got her fair share of it when she was growing up. It passed yeah. on to me and yeah. so forth. And so she could, she could relate to the plight I found myself. And I was a pretty sickly kid with asthma growing up. And so she would be there. You know, she was the kind of mom as most moms and caregivers are that, you know, if there was like a cargo plane flying over your house, mm -hmm. you could still hear your son or daughter miss a breath just because yeah. of how tuned in right. they are. And, and my dad was the kind of guy that he would always be, you know, at my football games growing up. I remember intercepting a pass one time when I was in the fifth grade yeah. and I caught it on the one yard line, ran it all the way back for a touchdown and didn't know this. My dad had leaped out of the stands and ran the whole way with me, cheering me on. Really? Yeah. Wow. Now later on, they, they would move away and, and, yeah. and I would be completely independent and on my own. But yeah. it was those formative years that really taught me some things that, you know, what can I do to be the best version of myself? And if I have any control, Right. How can I choose to invest in my kids and those around me to make their lives better? Do you have brothers and sisters? I've got one sister that lives in Fort Worth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you, it sounds like you had a very close, healthy family growing up. Yeah, I, I would say that. You know, there, there's always, uh, you know, there's always a level of dysfunction in every family. But if you choose to embrace it, it makes it a whole lot more palatable. Right. You know, it's funny because when I went to college locally here, we didn't have the money right. to go to college. I, I looked at Texas Tech and UT and a couple other places, but there just wasn't the money. So because of the leadership that I had shown in high school, right. I was able to get a scholarship to the local college. And that ended up being one of the biggest blessings. And it ties into the question, John, you asked, you know, who are some of my greatest influences? Mm -hmm. There were two professors I had, actually a couple, but I'll, I'll name two, uh, Dr. Domain and Dr. McCallum. And Dr. McCallum was one of my favorite professors. And she just had this ability that when she would listen to you as a student, mm -hmm. she made you feel like you were the one person in her entire universe. She just had this infectious smile mm -hmm. and you just felt connected to her. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Domain was someone that you could just pitch ideas to. And he was one of my early communication professors. And then there was Dr. Hickey, my debate coach, and he taught me something very valuable. He said, Derek, if you want to get things done, give it to a busy person. Mm -hmm. Busy people find a way to get things done. You know, there's this perception that I'm just going to go to school and not work and not participate and just so I can study. And mm -hmm. often they get lower grades than the people who really have a compressed schedule. And I'm that same way now running, you know, a couple different businesses. I tend to be more productive when there's a finite, I've got 30 minutes to get this done. And I know it'll be 90% done because I have to, there's no choice to procrastinate. I simply don't have time to procrastinate today. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it strikes me too, that starting early in life, that you extract from life, all that there is. You did it as a kid. You did it in college. You're doing it. Uh, you did it throughout your career. And now you're in a new phase of your life and you're doing it again. 
and it, it, it's very satisfying, isn't it? It is. And I'll tell you a quick story about that. So every year I've done this now for about five years mm -hmm. in July, I take a sabbatical. Mm -hmm. So I go away by myself for about five days to think and pray and journal. Mm -hmm. And it's helped me really clarify what is it that I really want? Because mm -hmm. I tend to move really quickly, but I realized it's pretty foolish to move quickly towards something that you don't want. Mm -hmm. And so what I began to do was I pulled back and I took a couple of days and just began to look and what are the things I want to accomplish and run really fast toward this year. Mm -hmm. And so this was July of 2019. I was in the W Hotel in downtown Boston. I picked that place to go. And I was asking myself some questions about, I loved my financial planning practice, but it really wasn't giving me the fulfillment I had once felt I had sort of mastered that and wanted a new challenge. Mm -hmm. I began to list out some things that I would really enjoy doing. And so when you're by yourself and there's no distractions, suddenly you get a clear, it's almost like this blank canvas gets put in front of you and there's a fresh set of paint and you get to paint the picture of what it is that you want for your life and not what everyone tells you you should have for your life or what you've always done. It's this fresh restart. It's such a magical moment. And I began to write out, I wrote, said, write a book, launch a podcast, coach, speak, teach other advisors how to build their practices. And that morning, I felt like I was being led and, and really just made the decision to sell my practice. After 25 years, it was time to bet on myself again. Right. And so fast forward now, January of 2020, I sold my financial planning business, fully exited in July, and now I've had the past two years to write uh, the book to my right here, mm -hmm. to launch the Good Money Podcast, I'm coaching and speaking, and now I feel like I'm giving back in a way where I'm taking the lessons and really, you know, some of the learnings I've learned to give those to people so they can achieve success in a fraction of the time right. that it took me. But I would encourage everybody if they can, that might be an hour, it might be a day, it might be a couple of days, but before the end of the year, take some time and pull back and ask yourself, is my life exactly where I want it to be right now? Mm -hmm. And when I lay my head on the pillow at night, do I feel like I'm living a life of meaning and significance? And if not, you will have to make a change because we know the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And that mm -hmm. doesn't get you the results that you want. Right. Why did you choose to become a financial advisor in the beginning? You know, it's funny, growing up, I've always enjoyed money. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I still have these cash books that my mom bought me when I was a kid, and I would record every single penny I found on the ground. If I found a quarter, <laughs> I didn't have a two five. For my first paycheck, I made $3.35 an hour at Minyard Food Stores, a local grocery store here. Yes. And I just enjoyed saving money, setting goals, but I also found that I enjoyed giving money as well. Mm. I remember our local uh, food bank that our church would sponsor, mm -hmm. uh, I would donate money as a kid just because I just enjoyed the challenge of, I enjoyed making money, mm. but I had this spot in my heart that said, if I have that ability, it's really expected of me to go make as much as I can to then do as much good as I can mm -hmm. for those people who may not have that opportunity. Right. And that really guided me. So I, I, I went to uh, work at a small software company and I had a decision to make about a year and a half into the business. And this is something I learned from my dad, but it was an example of where you learn what not to do. You know, my dad had always talked about, Derek, I want to get a part-time job and I want to have my own business, but he would always get to the edge of that precipice and, and he couldn't make that jump. It was just some worry and fear about what the future looked like. Right. And I realized I got passed over for a bonus and we had worked a lot of hours and I was the one non-engineer in the firm. Right. And it was that moment I realized, boy, am I going to be in this situation where I'm dependent on someone else mm. to tell me my economic value or right. will I choose to bet on myself and build my own business where I can tell myself what my economic value is, what's going to give me the greatest potential there. And I chose the other path, which has been the correct path of building my own business. And what that did was I then began to look around and say, I like to work with money. And as I looked at my parents and their friends, 
there wasn't really anyone at the time providing guidance that was really helpful on how much to retire and how do they save and get out of debt and, and build this economic independence that people wanted. And that's what led me to do that. And so I then in the evenings while working full time, went back to school and got my licenses and began to build my practice and eventually said, okay, I've got to let the full-time job go and move into this new opportunity. And it was, you know, 25 years. It wasn't always easy. I'll put it that way. You, mm. you had to learn to cope with rejection. Right. You think you get all these licenses and you learn all this knowledge and people are going to be beating down your door to work with you. Right. And uh, that's not the case. You've got to keep pursuing. And probably out of every 10 people I talked to, nine would say no, but one would say yes. And what I learned, John, was that one person was waiting for someone like me to find them. And I tell you that because people who start a business, you've got to recognize that you're going to face a lot of rejection, mm -hmm. but you've got to get through that mm -hmm. to get to the person who needs you the most right now. Right. Because they know the value that you can provide to them. So don't shut down after the first rejection or the fifth or the sixth. Right. You've got to go through probably 10 of them to then reach the ideal person who's going to really value you and mm -hmm. probably for a lot of other people like them who value you mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. You told lots of stories about be, having an interest in money, but it, but I believe that you really have a, a, a an interest in people there that the, the, and you must have many, many stories around the people that you met over the years, uh, people who built businesses and uh, were enormously successful and people who did not and, and, and struggled in life. Can you share a little bit about what that was like for you? You know, it's interesting. Let me take you into my office as a former financial advisor about 10 years ago. Yeah. And there was a gentleman named Dave that came into my office and I could tell that something was on his mind. He looked like he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. Mm -hmm. We exchanged some small talk and I said, Dave, what's wrong? And he began to tell me that, you know, Derek, recently, he said, I haven't felt as motivated to go to my business anymore. I'm not feeling like there's a sense of meaning. I'm questioning what am I doing as a business owner? And for some reason, I asked him point blank. I said, Dave, is there a cause that you care deeply about? And mm -hmm. I could tell the question caught him by surprise. He leaned back a little bit and he began to recount a story a couple years earlier that when he and his family had gone overseas on a trip, mm -hmm. a village they had gone to, he remembered the guide telling them that this village was so poor, so poverty stricken mm -hmm. because there wasn't a school building in place. It was causing this entire generation to be held back economically and uh, with opportunities. Mm -hmm. And he said to his wife, wouldn't it be fun to fund that school? Now, he just meant that as a comment, didn't realize how they might do it. Right. So that story brought it all back to present day. And I said, Dave, what if you did this? What if you set a sales goal for your business mm -hmm. and you took half of that increase over the next six months mm -hmm. and used that to fund that school? Mm -hmm. he had a big grin on his face and suddenly he connected mm -hmm. meaning to money, mm -hmm. profits to purpose, a cause to his cash. Mm -hmm. And what he did is he went back and he began to let his customer base know that I call this in my book, your generosity purpose. Mm -hmm. He said, our generosity purpose is we're going to take a portion of all of our profits and use it to fund this school. So on the website, he created a picture of what the school could look like and, and gave a story so people could enter into something bigger than themselves, which inside of all of us, mm -hmm. we have that desire to help other people, we just need a doorway that people can open for us to walk through. Mm -hmm. But what he didn't expect was it re-engaged his team. Mm -hmm. No longer was his team just working for Dave at a job. Now right. they were working to help make the world better and mm -hmm. provide a school, but it also re-motivated and reinvigorated Dave himself. Mm -hmm. He comes back in the office, not six months later, but three months later, he looks younger he looks back on his game. He looks all in. He mm -hmm. said, Derek, I can't believe what this did to transform me in the business, but it brought him in new customers. His team was re-engaged, but Dave became a more purpose-driven business owner. Right. And what Dave experienced, we then began to roll that concept out to hundreds of business owners across the country. 
and they have all seen similar success. And now we know that it's actually backed up by research. And I'll tell you that real quick. One of my colleagues who I mentioned in my book, Good Money Revolution, her name is Bebo Calandro. Mm -hmm. So she did some brain research and the brain research shows that if someone is watching TV and they see an ad for a car or a TV show, they, they recognize that process and then they move on. Mm -hmm. But if they see an ad where there's something about making the world better or saving the whales or helping the homeless or supporting the Olympic team with a cause, there's a part of your brain that connects emotionally to that. And get this, it's the same emotion as if you're looking into the eyes of someone you love. Mm. And it's so powerful and it just connects the human heart of all of us that we want to do better. We want to be part of something bigger but we don't know how. So I believe now, and this is proving out right now, mm -hmm. that if you're in business, you need to have a cause that is connected to your business to stand out from your competitors. Listen, people can buy what you're offering from anybody, right. but if they have a business where it connects to something locally or globally that right. makes the world better, they'll probably spend more money and they'll work with you because they get a great product and they get great impact all at the same time. Mm -hmm. I shared with you that I chair our World Community Service Committee in the Denver Rotary Club. And three years ago, I went to India and uh, was there for a business school reunion, but went to Delhi and Agra for the purpose of uh, looking at some schools that we had invested in. And um, while I was there, I uh, had the Oh, well, I might as well have my picture in front of the Taj Mahal. I posted it on Facebook and uh, someone responded, an old high school friend, and made the comment that that must have been the highlight of your trip. And of course, you know, it wasn't. Um, back in Delhi then, um, I went to a ribbon cutting for toilet facilities. We put in five toilet facilities and hand washing stations for a girls' school of 1,200 girls wow. in Delhi. Uh, and that's the kind of work that Rotary does that uh, now I'm, I'm hooked. So when I read your article, and I'm so excited uh, about your book, that, um, that really resonated with me. So I thank you. Well, thanks for that story. And uh, what, what I find is, you know, COVID has been a big reset for so many people, it's caused people to ask themselves, I've always gone to a job or I've had my business just to make money, yes. but it's caused people to look deeper within themselves. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is, why am I working at a job where I derive no meaning from it? Right. It doesn't make the best version of me. And so part of the book was intended to really empower people to say, look, whatever the job is in, in right now, if you choose to stay there, great. If you choose to leave, find something that, that's great as well, but always be adding value. You know, everybody's right. favorite radio station is WIIFM, which is what's in it for me. Right. And people go to their boss these days and they try to knock on the door. They demand a raise. You know, boss, my expenses have gone up. I need to be paid more money. Well, the boss might relent these days because it's hard to hire quality people and retain them. They might give you a raise, but that doesn't give you the value right. that you deserve. And so my contention is that if you ask yourself three questions in whatever job you're in right now, you're likely to make more money because you're helping the company and the business owner make money. The three questions are, what can I do to increase sales? Mm -hmm. What can I do to reduce expenses? Mm -hmm. And what can I do to help grow this business? I'll give you a quick story. Yes. One of the people I met with recently, she was a, an administrative assistant. So in most people, you might think that's like the almost the lowest rung in a, in a business. But she was in charge of ordering supplies, and she was frustrated that she wasn't making the money she felt she deserved. So I said, well, you can bang on the boss's door, get the 4% raise, but that's not going to get you where you want to go. Right. So we worked up a couple of ideas outside the box, and one was, for every dollar that she saved in supply costs for the company, she pitched her boss on, give me 10% of those savings as my incentive. So he was saving 90%. She was getting 10. It was clearly an advantage for the business owner. And he loved that idea. Suddenly now, this person who was this salaried employee is thinking like an entrepreneur. 
Then the bigger idea for her was she recognized her boss would always complain about he saw all the clients at the company and would always complain about there was no capacity for the company to grow. So we came up with this an idea that what if she were to get licensed uh, and got her engineering uh, certificate where she could then service the lowest 25% of the clients, which would then give her boss more capacity to see more people. And then she could then get bonus based on business that she brought in on those 25%. Right. Her boss loved that idea as well, because now it was a win-win. It allowed him to make more money, grow the business. She made more money. And then the last idea was they had one salesperson in this entire company to bring in new business. And what the idea was that we brought to the boss was empower your entire team to be your sales force. And so everybody that you introduce to the sales department, they get a nice sizable bonus based on whatever the contract is that gets signed. Well, suddenly now you have this empowered entire company who wants to grow and the business owner always is making the most money, but it's empowering those team members say, look, I'm going to get something what's in it for them and they love it. And so that's what I would encourage business owners today listening right now to say, how can I empower my team? Because you got to realize people are coming for your employees right now. Mm -hmm. They want to hire your greatest people away. You need to build the case for them to stay. Right. And that's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. That is a fabulous story, a story of empowerment. Yeah. What, what about now that you've made the transition to this new um, practice area or business, what has, what's been different about it? Well, it's interesting because there, there's been a couple lessons I've learned. One is that even in selling a very successful financial planning practice, you would think that automatically, Derek, you're going to jump into something new and have an equal amount of success right off the bat. Right. And that's not the case. What I've realized is that I'm a better person now. I have a lot more life experience and the success I'm getting now is quicker, but I had to realize and go back 25 years and say, Derek, remember that it always takes time to build a strong foundation. We know that if people build a house right. and they need to build before the cement has fully dried and it's as strong as it can be, there's mm -hmm. going to be weaknesses that get revealed when there's more pressure put on it. Mm -hmm. And so that's lesson one is that I'm sort of back. I used to be a, a big fish in a small pond and I just got tossed into willingly. Now I'm a small fish in a bigger pond all over again. Sure. So, sure. so I, I take what I call my humility pills every single day and recognize, okay, this is where we're going. But also what I realize is that to be successful these days, and I, I counsel all of my clients on this, you can't focus just on the features and benefits of what you offer because everybody has features and benefits. You need to own a problem. And that is, you know, there's people out there that, for example, as a financial advisor, there's no shortage of financial advisors in the world. But if you can talk about how we help people get peace of mind so they can do the things they want in retirement, I mean, right. that is a problem and a worry people have. And if you can articulate that mm -hmm. in a way that resonates with them, you now become known as the specialist. And what I once was, was in retirement income planning. So now when people need that, they wanna work with a specialist and not the generalist. They're willing to pay more for the specialist. And you begin to work with high quality clients and you're solving the same problems over and over again. And, and the parallel that I think about is, you know, if you think about your favorite uh, music group, you know, for the younger group and maybe Coldplay, you know, maybe, you know, it was Lawrence Welk back in the days, wh whoever it may be. Do you think that every stop they go on, they're sitting down, they're rewriting their music, they're coming up with new songs? No, they're simply singing what people expect them to sing in a fresh way every single concert. They simply show up and they're the experts of what they do. And I believe right now the business owners that choose to be the expert and they choose to specialize in a problem and they own that problem, it will attract people because people want medicine for the pain they're feeling right now, whether it's economically, whether it's physically, whether it's relationally, there's so many opportunities right now, but don't rely on people to try to figure out your website and figure out what you do. 
you've got to clearly say, here's the problem our company solves. And here's how you'll feel once that problem is solved. And you will see incremental increases in your business. You've already described one of the biggest problems that business leaders face. What are some of the other issues that you've encountered? Well, one of the biggest ones right now is that when they read and they listen to the current news cycle, mm -hmm. there's a vibe that says, listen, high inflation, economy worries, people aren't spending as much. You better just uh, close up your doors and maybe come back to your business a year from now because your sales are going to drop. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a quick story. So this was a couple years ago back in one of the other economic downturns and some of the Lexus dealerships in California, uh, they got together and they recognized that, look, with the economy getting softer, we're going to sell less cars. We're not going to go out of business, but they projected that there'd be less sales. And so they had to come up with a new strategy. And what they did was they said, if people aren't going to come to our dealerships, we need to go to where the affluent people are. So they began to take their Lexuses to the golf courses, to the marinas, to the art galleries, you know, to the symphony. And as people would have different discussions, people would say, hey, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a banker, I'm an attorney, whatever it is. Then they would say, hey, what do you do? They said, well, I, I actually sell Lexuses. Yeah. And they would say, have you ever driven a Lexus? And they'd say, no, well, you know, I happen to have one right out front. Why don't we go for a test drive? And if you've ever driven, a brand new car, and then you got back into your old car, you thought <laughs> your car was fine until then. Right. And what happened was, surprisingly, they sold even more cars during the economic downturn because they shifted how they solved the problem. Right. And so what I would tell people right now is, I want you to, to accept this mantra that I say every day, and that is, I've heard there's a recession coming, but I've decided not to participate. <laughs> and the mentality great. is, yeah. look, look, this is reality. And so there, there's always winners right. in the game of business. Right. And I want this person listening to just recognize, look, you can still win. It just won't look like how you won last year, mm -hmm. but you can still win if you focus on solving the current problems that people are facing. Right. That's a terrific story. Um, you know, you were great with numbers in the beginning. Then you learned about people. You, that started in high school. In writing a book, now you had to develop a new skill, and that is writing. Were you good at writing uh, at an early age, or did you have to develop that later? I, I would say it was a developed skill. And there's something I learned early on you know, there's always that expression that all of us have a book inside of us. And I wanted to add value to people's lives. I didn't just want to write a book that would just be a bucket list item. So the first book I wrote, which was about 15 years ago, was dedicated directly toward financial advisors. Mm. And part of how I built my practice was I was a young guy, you know, didn't have any gray hair 30 years ago. And I asked myself as I looked in the mirror, who in their right mind is going to invest with that young looking kid, for goodness sakes? Right. And so I had to come up with a new strategy. And the strategy was I wanted to get on television. And so I would go early uh, to the office. And back in the day, we had what were called fax machines for the younger audience. You, you put a piece of paper in, it spits it out, et cetera. And I would reach out to the local news stations and say, when you need a financial topic discussed in an easy to understand way, call yeah. me. Yeah. I did this for about six months diligently every single week. Mm. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Suddenly I got a call back. Hey, Derek, we've got an issue. Can you come talk about it? And I said, sure, happy to do it. Having never been on television before, but I knew putting my back against the wall, I would find a way to make it work. And so once I knew the date and the topic, I practiced, I visualized, and I could just picture this interview going so well. And in my mind, I always like to connect what is the ultimate goal of how I want this to end. And I just visualized that after the interview, the producer would say, Derek, you're really made for television. We'd like to have you come back on a regular basis. So the interview went great. And the producer says, Derek, that was great. We'd love to have you come back. And that was the sign for me that this could be a medium that I could really help take complicated financial topics yes. and make them easy to understand. Because that was a game. That was a problem that everybody had because money was so complex and so thought of that You've got to have the special training and special knowledge to be successful. 
that's not the case at all. Right. You know, and so I realized that by using those skills and enabled me then to build my business. But in that book, what I talked about is if I can do it, you can do it as well. And ultimately, people were looking not just for smart financial acumen and the ability to help people make money, but when we connected that generosity purpose to things, what I found was that people like to work with people who care about what they care about. And it's what grew my financial planning practice. I had a passion for education and supporting teachers and students. And I went back to my alma mater high school, Sam Houston High School here in Arlington, Texas. Right. I began to give out a teacher of the month and a student of the month award. And, and John, get this. I gave out like a $50 Amazon gift card, a $25 one to the student. You would have thought they won the lottery for goodness sakes. Mm -hmm. And what I learned was it was just because people cared about them mm -hmm. and appreciated them. So this would go in the newspaper and so forth, a picture of me with the student and the principal. And I began to get phone calls from people saying, hey, Derek, we'd like to work with you. And I finally asked one lady on the third call, why did you pick me? I'm 25 years old. Right. Uh, you could work with any advisor. She said, Derek, it's because you care about education and we care about education. And it just taught me that if you think, listening right now, that you have to be the smartest person in the room on your topic, you are holding yourself back. Right. You need to be smart at connecting with the person, listening to them, making sure they feel understood. And if you do that, even if you don't know the topic, you can find someone else to help you, right. but they want to work with you. Right. You know, the other thing that you brought to mind is that everyone loves to help. Everyone wants to make the world a better place. But we don't know how to do it oftentimes. And that's what Rotary has done for us is it gives us that vehicle. We've got the brand name of Rotary that's more than 100 years old. And we've got methods in the same way that you have your uh, good money framework methodology. Rotary provides us with a methodology by which to help people around the world in an effective manner. So that's good. And it's interesting, you know, when you talk about Rotary, I joined Rotary back in 1999. Yeah. I was about, about four or five years into the business. And it was a chance for me to just build relationships. Right. And what happened over the next 10 years or so is some of my very best clients came from that Rotary Club. And what I realized was it wasn't because I knew about money and, and, and so forth. It was when you can work on projects together, when there's a shared experience that you have of, of serving inside of a school or helping at the food pantry or doing something where you're making the world better, mm -hmm. it endears you to people. And then you create this story that can be told year after year. Hey, remember, John, when we did this and you laugh and, oh, yeah, well, there's that bond that you share that right. deepens not just that professional relationship, but that relationship that really impacts your local community. And one of the things that I've always believed is that, you know, I, I'm not the smartest person in the room, but what I've learned to do is by engaging people and asking engaging questions, mm -hmm. I learn so much more by asking questions than by trying to build myself up and prove myself to other people. Right. And I think people can, can have that attitude, especially right now, it will open more doors and to your point, I think business right now has a responsibility to open doors for their customers and clients to give them ways to give back. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, in my world, there's always people getting envelopes that say, hey, free retirement seminar, free steak dinner, we're going to get you better returns. And so if I build a business based on lowest cost or returns or things that are outside my control, eventually someone leaves because someone else can provide something better for them. But if I build it all on the relationship and helping them get what's important to them, mm -hmm. either part of helping make the community better, and I'm helping them do that, right. that's a powerful combination. It's just simply putting glue mm -hmm. all over the business because it's hard to pull pages that have been glued together without ripping, and rarely do people rip that apart. I'm headed to Thailand in December, and you know I've been invited by a friend but I'm going to enhance that trip and make it more enjoyable 
by meeting with Rotarians when I go. Um, that brand name means when I reach out to them, I'm pre I'm vetted already. I, they know that I'm an okay guy. Yes. Um, and we're going to together find some problems in this world that need solving. And, uh, and that methodology is going to help that problem get solved in the best manner. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so important because when you're with like-minded people and the reason I wrote this book, and by the way, if I may say this, you know, I, the book has become a USA Today and uh, Amazon and Wall Street Journal bestseller. Yes. And Part of it is because people are embracing this message that there has to be a better way to do business today and for people to do better with their money. And so to help get this message out, I'm giving away the first five chapters for free. People can download those for free at goodmoneychapters.com. Uh, that's goodmoneychapters.com. Download the first five chapters, which goes over some initial part of the framework so it can add value to people right away, goodmoneychapters.com. But I didn't realize that when I wrote this book, where the economy would be, where inflation would be, where people's worries would be. And it only further exemplifies that right now, it separates really people who are serious about growing their business. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like the emperor's new clothes where people realize, you know, they, they, they've been naked all this time and now they're sort of revealed. And I, I want people, as you talked about, whether they're in their local community, just to be asking, you can ask your kids or your grandkids or ask yourself, what is something that I could help with right now? It might be simply buying a book for your niece or your nephew or someone at church or one of your neighbor's sons or daughters that, you know, they're struggling a bit, but they're so bright. They just need a bit of encouragement given to them. And it might be, hey, I'm going to buy a real estate book at Barnes and Noble with a note that says, hey, Susan, I believe in you and feel like your best days are ahead. Sincerely, John, and you give that book to her, cost you 20 bucks, but it's an investment that has an immeasurable amount of opportunity because somebody believed in her. And I think right now, you know, when we see this all the time, the business owners that just focus on padding their bank accounts and growing their, their investment returns make a lot of money, which is a temporary high, right? but she diminishes until they can connect the why. I want to do this so that yes. I can help make this cause better. I can improve these people's lives. And now there's a reason, there's this contagiousness that envelops a business when they're running the business to not just add value to people's lives and solve their problems. Now they're helping solve the problems of the community. And when you become that community hero, it just puts a moat around your business because people want to work with that person because you're helping meet their problem, but you're meeting their sort of their Maslow's hierarchy of needs by giving them meaning while you're solving their problem. And that's a powerful combination. You, we have such great tools available to us now, and uh, you've started the Good Money podcast. When did you start it? What is its purpose and what kind of guests do you have? So I started the, the Good Money podcast. This would have been back May of 2020. So we're at the height of the pandemic. Yeah, right? perfect time. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I had a choice to make. And the choice was either to focus on writing a book yes. or launching a podcast. And what I began to process was if I write the book, I'd have plenty of time to do it. But there is a crisis occurring right now. Yes. And the podcast would allow me to have a voice and connect with people at a time when they needed connection. And so I chose the podcast and we began to launch it. We, we've had some great guests. I mean, we've had you know, Damon John, Matthew McConaughey, artists, business owners. We've even done some coaching sessions on the podcast. The purpose of it is, is to go against what culture says, first of all, that says, if you have money, you're bad. And if you make a lot of money, you're the automatic villain in this story. Right. Now, I think back to when it was the pandemic and people were criticizing Jeff Bezos and these other high profile CEOs. I, for one, was thankful that mm -hmm. Amazon could deliver something the next day as I'm growing this new business because I could get it quickly. And so I was celebrating that. And, and the way that I combated that was I just bought Amazon stock. I mean, if you're going to complain about something, just go buy the stock. That way you benefit right. from the very thing 
bothering you. And so if I'm at the gas pump and gas prices are high, if I own ExxonMobil stock or Occidental, hey, at least I'm benefiting from that. So you always want to think like this savvy investor wherever you're at in your financial lives. And so the podcast was a way to bring on guests and really empower people to say, go make money, go make a lot of it, and let the motivation be to use it for good. Mm-hmm. And so we've really gone deeper and, and people have revealed things they've never shared before on any other interviews. They talk about why money is important to them and what they've done with it and the stories of how they give and how they have grown themselves and their business by giving are so, so powerful. And now we're using it as a way to really help people grow their wealth and their business. And uh, just the stories, I, I hope other people learn a lot because as the host, I'm learning a ton. And so I'm so thankful for those great conversations. One of our recent speakers, uh, Scott Reynolds Nelson, wrote a book called Oceans of Grain. He's a professor at the University of Georgia in Athens. And he took us back to um, the 19th century and the development and growth of this country. And it reminded me that it took uh, entrepreneurs, it took business, it took nonprofit organizations and religious organizations and it took government all working together to make this great country. And as I travel the world, and I'm sure you as well, we're reminded of how special and unique we are and uh, how lucky we are to live and work in this environment. You know, we are, and I I never want to take that for granted. And I'll tell you a quick story. One of my good friends, his name is Brian Buffini. And he runs one of the largest real estate coaching companies in America. I've had him on my podcast. I was on his podcast. And he wrote a book called The Immigrant Edge. And it was the whole perspective was, you know, when I go and I look at different industries like donut stores or dry cleaners, or there are certain industries where there's a heavy immigrant presence that's there. And when I go there, I'm always inspired because it reminds me that they came to America because they wanted to be here. They had to get here and they wanted to have the success that America could offer. If I'm being honest, I can take that for granted. There are days I can be complacent thinking that I can, I can be successful. I was born in America and it's always good to have a healthy dose of optimism and even humility by being around immigrants because they have this fresh mentality that Derek, I didn't come from money and it's up to me Mm -hmm. to redefine my generational pathway forward. And it's so, so inspiring. And so those are things that motivate me on a regular basis. So even though when I see political turmoil and economic worries and economic uncertainty, I think, you know what, keep it in perspective, Derek, put that in the box of things I can't control, but I can is how I show up today. Am I going to make this Monday? Am I going to make this Tuesday? Whatever day it is, the best day I can make it based on what I can control, which is typically my activity Mm. and my attitude and my response to things I cannot control. And as long as I can keep letting go of what I can't control and control me, which oftentimes is as unruly as they come, that is the pathway for me to be successful. You just reminded me that what I forgot to mention is our amazing educational institutions here in the United States that serve as a magnet for those immigrants uh, so often. And as a volunteer on the extramural grants department for the American Cancer Society, I see that each year as those grant applications come in. And they're from people who come from other places around the world. And what an amazing thing that is, that it's like we, the United States, are fortunate enough to get the first round draft choice of so many brilliant people. Um, So, yeah, thank you for that reminder. I I think that's such a great point. And, uh, you know, I think now is a good time also to just really connect with people that may have thought, you know, Derek, I don't have enough money to really do any good, or I'm so far in debt, I can't right. really make an impact. Yes. And what I would tell you is, you know, one of the things that we hear about lottery winners, and we see this with athletes and even actors that suddenly get a whole lot of money, right. it doesn't change who they are, it makes them more of who they already are. 
and it's what causes them to go either this way or this way. And, and if they've already been good with money with a little, they've managed it well and they've given and they've, they've been generous and they have been prudent with how they've done things, more money gives them more tools to do more good with. But if they've never had money or they've never made good decisions, they've always been in debt, they've always had this mentality that minimalist thinking rules, they will often then lose that money very, very quickly. And so what I would tell people is, so many people listening may feel like they just don't have control of their lives. And money, I think, is the greatest lever for positive change that we have. And so what I would tell you is, look, today, take a dollar, take $5, and use that in a cause that you care about. Mm -hmm. That way you've controlled one part of your life today, and in a very, very small way, you have made a conscious decision that you can be proud of that you've helped make the world better. Mm -hmm. And then maybe next month, I wanna make that $10 or $20. The key is when you start doing that, it for some reason, I'm not even sure how this works, but it gets you outside of your bubble of problems and it lets you begin thinking like a manager where you're seeing the problem and you're not sucked into the core of the problem. Once we can pull ourselves out of the whirlwind, as they say, and begin to see the storm from a distance, we can make smarter decisions, but tying meaning to your money, I just find is the central key to give people that true meaning of fulfillment and giving back that they've always wanted to do. Derek, I, you know, I, I've so much enjoyed getting to know you today in this first conversation. I want this to be a long-term relationship between you and I, and uh, I hope we can continue having conversations around these important topics. Is there anything that I may, might have forgotten today to ask you <clears throat> that you'd like to share with our audience? Well, John, let me just say, I look forward to this being a long-term friendship as well. And, uh, you know, it's funny, whenever, when you reached out to me, knowing that you were also a fellow Rotarian, it's an automatic yes, because mm -hmm. we share similar values. And I'll tell you a quick story. I was the past president of our Rotary Club about 10 years ago. Yes. And every year they send the incoming president to the presidential conference. Ours was in Lisbon, Portugal. And it was fascinating to see all of the flags of all of the Rotarians all around the world. I mean, you can get so USA myopic that suddenly there was everybody. Right. And I began to ask people one question, everybody I met. And it was, you know, what is it that you care most about Rotary? And they would tell me, you know, Derek, I'm in Rotary so that I can be a better version of myself. Yes. So I can help my kids have a better life. I can help my family have a better life. Everybody's answer was they wanted their lives to help other people have a better life. And I left there captivated and really changed as a human to my core. And when I came back, those were some of the principles I put into my business that, you know, everybody you meet with may come to your office with a stated problem, mm -hmm. but it's really your job to bring a shovel to every client visit and you're digging deeper. You're even helping them dig deeper to find out what are some of the core values, the core desires that they have. So when they buy from you that service or product that you have, you're truly helping solve their problem, but you're making their lives better. And that's what I think Rotary offers everybody, but even just in business principles, when you think about not just looking at the customer as a dollar sign, you're looking at them as someone that you can build a relationship with and someone who you can help transform their life. People connect with that and they want to do business with people who feel like they understand their concerns and their worries. Mm -hmm. What a great way for us to wrap up today's conversation. This was the first I look forward to many more meetings with you. Thank you for the work that you do. And uh, with that, we'll sign off. Thank you, John. Great to be with you today. Thanks, Derek.